Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to start the presentation schedule for today. I'm pleased to introduce um, Graham Kerr, CEO of, uh, of South32. South32 is a uh, diversified mining company with its operations um, predominantly in the southern hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Well, I apologise up front. I've got a terrible case of the flu. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. It's a great honour to be presenting at BMO yet again for the third consecutive year. We recently announced our half-year results for FY19. Today I'll start by taking you through the highlights before moving on to our short and longer-term outlook, including the progress we have made in reshaping our portfolio as we position South 32 for the future. As always, I draw your attention to the important notices on slide two. To our highlights, a strong operating results and higher commodity prices helped deliver improved earnings and returns to shareholders in the half. Underlying EBITDA increased by 20%, underlying earnings by 18%, free cash flow from operations was $718 million, and we closed the period with a net cash balance of $678 million. Our strong financial position allowed us to announce a fully franked interim dividend of 5.1 cents per share and a fully franked special dividend of 1.7 cents per share, taking total dividends declared for the half to $344 million. These returns came in addition to the $167 million returned to shareholders during the half through the continuation of our on-market share buyback program. Of our $1 billion capital management program, the remaining $127 million is expected to be returned to shareholders by mid-April, depending on market liquidity and value with our market on share buy with our on-market share buyback. Over the past six months, we've made real progress reshaping our portfolio, completing the acquisition of Arizona Mining and Eagle Downs, advancing Greenfields Exploration Partnerships and progressing the divestment of South Africa Energy Coal. Before discussing our sustainability performance, I'd like to address our approach to tailings management. Our thoughts are with family members, friends and colleagues who have lost or are missing loved ones as a result of a tailings collapse near Brumadino in Brazil. This is an industry changing event. The industry needs to rebuild trust and increase transparency about the risks that exist but also push hard to have a common reporting framework so companies that are doing well or better can be clearly identified and shareholders can ask questions about the ones that aren't. Moving to our sustainability performance and starting with safety, we are working hard to create a workplace where we can guarantee everyone returns home well and safe at the end of every shift. At total recordable injury frequency and employee occupational illness rates both showed encouraging trends in the past six months, and we've seen a significant improvement in the proactive identification and reporting of potential significant events. Greenhouse gas emissions are tracking below target, and we are progressing climate resilient assessments at our operations. While we haven't included the figures on our slide here today, we also continue to make progress towards our diversity objectives in our workforce and leadership teams, as we strive to create an inclusive workplace which reflects the communities where we operate. Moving to our operations, a strong operating performance, high commodity prices and robust cost control ensured our operating margin remained elevated at 38%. We achieved another production record of Australian manganese and significantly improved long wall productivity at Illawarra Metallurgical Coal, where we've increased production guidance by 7% to 6.5 million tonnes. We continue to benefit from our long alumina position. However, the elevated prices in the alumina market and higher pitch and coke prices place great pressure on aluminium smelters as the LME price declined by 9% in the period. At our, hillside, at our hillside smelter in particular, we continue to focus on the costs we can control around labour to ensure the smelter is set up for a sustainable success through the cycle. We have commenced consultation to restructure the business with the aim of reducing controllable costs and improving hillside's resilience to volatility in commodity markets. Separately, we continue to negotiate with ESCOM 
to deliver a power contract that will underpin the long-term sustainability of the smelter. For the full year, we have lowered or maintained unit cost guidance at all operations and expect group volumes to rise by 5% in FY19 and by 7% in FY20 as our operations deliver more consistent production. I want to touch on a couple of our key commodities, including manganese. We had a shift in our view about 24 months ago that has really played out in the past 12 months. With great degradation in China and an increase in the intensity of use in steel making, the supply response had to come from South Africa with ultra low grade ore. As a result, the cost curve has steepened with no substitutes available through scrap and the next phase of South African supply to come from underground, we think the industry economics for manganese are very attractive and that Gemco is still by far the best asset in the industry. Moving to Illumina, where we have a 3.4 million tonne long position into the third party index market. We haven't changed our long term view of price despite the recent impacts of supply disruptions. Looking forward, we expect aluminium demand to pick up in the second half of 2019 following a soft 2018 as demand for autos improves, providing additional demand for alumina. Given the finely balanced nature of alumina supply into aluminium, we expect prices to be supported in both the near and the longer term as deteriorating Chinese bauxite supply and the cost of importing ore from West Africa or Southeast Asia will continue to steepen the cost curve. Our words are refinery in Western Australia, which is in the first quartile of the cost curve, is expected to see further benefits to costs in the second half of this year as we consume less caustic soda, soda and highest price inventory rolls off. Our non-operated aluminium refinery will benefit from the same dynamic in caustic soda prices, while a reduction in bauxite costs relating to its index pricing mechanism will provide a further tailwind to costs. Moving to our portfolio, we continue to develop a pipeline of opportunities to compete for capital with a bias towards base metals. We constantly review our portfolio, having started life four years ago with the collection of assets and no brownfield or greenfield options. We continue to unlock opportunities in some of these businesses. In Brazil, our partners have approved a pre-feasibility study to extend the life of mine at MRN with a lower capital cost option. At Worsley Illumina, we have commenced several improvement initiatives that are expected to support a sustainable increase in production to nameplate capacity. At Illawarra, we advance the Dendrobium Next Domain project into feasibility, and we move closer to approval to explore the southern areas at Gemco. We are working hard to reshape our portfolio. During the half, we completed the acquisition of Arizona Mining, adding the Hermosa project which is a high-grade zinc, lead, silver resource and prospective land package to our portfolio. We also completed the acquisition of a 50% interest in the Eagle Downs Metallurgical Coal Project and assumed operatorship. Eagle Downs embeds another attractive development option within our growing portfolio in a commodity where we see strong long-term fundamentals. I'll provide some more detail on both development projects shortly. Our process to divest South Africa Energy Coal remains on track with binding bids expected by the end of the financial year. In terms of building longer dated options, we believe in growing value by the drill bit. We are committed to greenfield exploration and are currently advancing partnerships in Australia, Europe and the Americas. We have maintained our option with Trilogy Metals for the third and final year of the agreement to potentially increase our interests in the Upper Kobuk Minerals Project in Alaska. We can earn a 50% interest in the high-grade Arctic polymetallic resource and a large copper target known as Bornite. Both properties have existing fine resources, with Trilogy completing a preliminary economic assessment of the Arctic project in April 2018. The option to earn a 50% interest can be exercised at any time before 31st of January 2020 by committing $150 million to the joint venture. Moving to Hermosa, which is one of the world's most exciting base metals projects. Work has commenced on the project studies and early stage infrastructure. 
We have undertaken further resource drilling to increase our knowledge of the ore body and remain on track to declare a maiden mineral resource for the project by the end of June this year. We have also identified a series of regional exploration targets that will form part of an initial exploration program on the Broaden land package. Our FY19 capital expenditure guidance for MOSA has been lowered from the preliminary $100 million estimate to $70 million, with the reduction largely reflecting the reclassification of $20 million of expenditure from the initial Arizona mining budget to capitalise exploration as we increase our knowledge of the Hermosa resource. We also completed the acquisition of a 50% interest in the Eagle Downs project during the period, giving us control of a fully permitted, partially developed metallurgical coal mine with a 1.1 billion tonne resource in Queensland's Bowen Basin. We have commenced feasibility work on the underground longwall project and expect to make a final investment decision with our JV partner during the second half of the 2020 financial year. Our approach to capital management remains unchanged. We will continue to drive return on invested capital by optimising our portfolio, making disciplined capital allocation decisions and prioritising a strong balance sheet to ensure we retain flexibility through economic cycles allowing us to return excess capital to shareholders. This approach has served our shareholders well to date. We have a strong $678 million net cash position, and with payment of our fully franked interim and special dividends and completion of our currently approved capital management program in the second half, we will have returned $2.4 billion to shareholders over the last three years, which is equivalent to 20% of our market capitalisation. To conclude, we are reshaping our portfolio, pursuing opportunities within our existing operations and advancing and cycling Greenfield's options to grow value per share. The ordinary and special dividends advanced to, announced at half year and continuation of our on market share buyback demonstrate our strong financial position and commitment to our capital management framework. We are well positioned entering the second half of the year, net cash is $678 million and group volumes are expected to rise by 5% in the 2019 financial year as our operations deliver more consistent production. We are well placed after a solid start to the year to continue to reshape our portfolio and build the foundations for future value creation. Thank you. Time for some questions. Are there any questions from the floor? It's metal focus. Um, do you, right here, right now, where sort of you see in the next couple of years in base metals, do you have one that's more interesting than the other, or you're agnostic just project by project? Sorry, I got to have the question again. It was a bit broken um, up there. You said you're very base metals focused, and I was curious right here, right now, where you, where you view base metals in the next few years. Do you have a, a one, that you, one or two that you favor over others, and are you just agnostic and it's project by project? Yeah, look, the way I think about it is we use the terminology we have a bias to base metals. So, for example, we have invested in Eagle Downs, which is a metallurgical coal project, because we like the fundamentals of that commodity. But likewise, we think for most of the base metals, there is a, a good picture when you look at the supply and demand dynamic. Um, Hermosa, for us, obviously, is silver, lead and zinc. It's something we know well through Cannington. The mining method, the processing facility and the customers will be very similar to Cannington. Um, the other, I guess, exploration place that we focus a lot of our time is around copper. You know, we're quite realistic at South 32 that when it comes to good copper deposits, we can't compete with BHP and Rio, who probably can't compete with the Chinese. So it's very much through the drill bit we look to increase our exposure in that space. And just as a follow-up, the two things you've done, you, you went out to Arizona Mining, came in as a minority, then liked it and took it. Your trilogy, you're a 12.5% shareholder with the opportunity to buy into 50% of the JV. Is it a fair conclusion for investors that, that that is how you prefer to do things, which is look at juniors in, in the exploration phase? Is that a fair conclusion? Yeah, look, I think that would be a fair conclusion. You know, we have roughly 20 projects running today in the greenfield space, 
as I stated in the, the presentation, we do believe in creating value through the drill bit rather than M&A, to be perfectly honest. And our preferred model is to team up with a junior who's very agile and quick on the ground and provide some technical guidance and also some commercial guidance and hopefully together discover a world-class deposit. Any other questions from the floor? Gentleman down here. Thank you, Graham. Paul Robinson from CIU. So I've got two questions, if that's okay. One, I'm just interested in Trilogy and you know, what, what analysis, what work will your team be doing over the next year um, to make a decision on that option on the 1st of January? And the second one, you know, I share the same views in terms of the strong fundamentals in Metcoal, but I'm just again interested in what, what's your three to four, five year plan for Metcoal as part of your portfolio? Thank you. Yep, so maybe if we tackle Trilogy first. Look, Trilogy, I think um, the team at Trilogy have done great work to date. When we started that option, it was basically a three-year option whereby we contribute $10 million a year. Every year had an exit option. We're now into the third year. We've elected to make the $10 million um, contribution this year to fund the program, plus we contribute another million dollars, which I'll speak about in a second. As I mentioned in the presentation, we like two deposits, Arctic and Bornite. Um, particularly we like Bornite at the start, but it's fair to say that Arctic, if you look at some of the fundamentals around Arctic, it's become stronger over time. We have up until the end of January next year to make a decision about committing $150 million into the joint venture to get 50-50. From our perspective, you know, this year's exploration program is going to be very important to see how that runs as we try and understand the size of Bornite. The $1 million I made the comment around earlier, that additional $1 million on top of the $10 million, that really is to understand more about the belt that Arctic sits in. Arctic is a VMS kind of deposit, um, and to date the focus in that belt has been very much on Arctic. We're interested in understanding what else is in that belt, because generally they occur in clusters. So depending on how that work goes on this year and how our team assesses it, then we'll make our assessment at the you know, end of January. Um, when it comes to metallurgical coal, probably two areas that we're driving on. One is getting Illawarra metallurgical coal back up to its nameplate capacity. This year it was good to see in the first half of the year that we ran the business at about a 7.6 million tonne per annum basis. We upped full year guidance to 6.5 million tonnes. Um, didn't run the same rate in the second half of the year because we've got two planned long wall moves plus we enter a new panel. But we are certainly back on track to get our production capacity back up to historical levels which will occur about the second half of FI20, and it's around the 8 million tonne mark. At the same time, Eagle Downs is going into feasibility states, um, and we expect to make a financial decision for that around the second half of 20 as well. You know, Eagle Downs is quite unique because it's, it's already permitted. A lot of the infrastructure is already built, including the, the drifts are about 40% complete. Um, there's some more work to be done on the drilling and understanding the different grade properties. But, you know, that's what the work in front of us looks like. But we certainly like the metallurgical coal space. Prices are high today. We think over time they'll moderate but still be attractive. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions that have been submitted through the app. Um, just sticking with Met Coal, do you see um, further opportunities in terms of adding to the portfolio there? Look, I think metallurgical coal is something we continue to watch the space and look for opportunities. Obviously, there's been a number of um, transactions that occurred in the coal space over the last 12 to 18 months. Fair to say that we've participated in some of those, particularly metallurgical coal, of which you know some of the bidding was probably a bit too um, rich for our blood in terms of we didn't see value in the transaction, so we didn't go all the way through to the end. We like metallurgical coal, but again, it's always through the lens of value, not through volume. And then another one from the app is, um, do you now view China as a structural aluminium exporter, and, and how does that affect your business? Sorry, that one again? Do, do, you, do you see China as a structural aluminium exporter? And how does that have a bearing on your, on your business? I mean, I'd start by saying when we think about that value chain from bauxite to alumina to aluminium, we're always very clear that we see most of the value from the bauxite to the alumina. Uh, we certainly don't see ourselves building new smelter capacity. Certainly don't think we can compete against China in that space. Um, I think, look, it has been an industry for a long period of time that's been overcapitalised and obviously increase in terms of investment in smelters, particularly in China, with probably little regard to economics, to be perfectly honest. Um, as we go forward, we see the aluminum and aluminium supply coming a bit more back into balance, and we think that's a good thing for the industry. 
Um, from our perspective, you know, we have a long position in Illumina, about 3.5, 3.4 million tonnes. They're all priced on the index, which we think is a good place to be in. Um, and that's probably our focus, getting the best out of Worsley. And then just, uh, just on the topic of, of your aluminium smelters, the, um, you touched on it in the presentation, but just um, with all of the, the issues at ESCOM at the moment, you know, how do you see that playing out with regards to your operations in South Africa and, uh, and Mozambique? Yeah, if people aren't aware, we obviously supply a fair bit of domestic coal for ESCOM today. They convert into electricity that we then use in the smelter. From, I guess, two different aspects, we watch with interest what's happening with ESCOM. One is we're in the process of divesting our South African energy coal business, and our objective there is to create a truly transformed South African company, which is consistent with the ANC, the Department of Minerals and Resources, and what ESCOM was looking to actually see. So I think that ticks the box for ESCOM. I think on the hillside, um, where we actually draw obviously a lot of power off the grid, you know, we have been in discussions with ESCOM now for probably over 12 months, particularly over the last six months, about ensuring a new long-term power contract that underwrites the sustainability of the smelter. We were making really good progress, but it's probably fair to say with ESCOM's current day-to-day -day issues, their focus is very much on the short term. Now, the positive about some of that focus on the short term is the fact that they recognise the importance of the smelters in terms of reserve capacity, but also one of the largest and very few paying customers in South Africa. So I think that's a positive, but obviously we'd like them to also think about the medium to long term, and hopefully they'll come back to the table and that in the next couple of months. But as an organisation, we'd be clear that we think ESCOM is one of the real threats at the moment to, if you like, the South African economy. Yeah. Um, and then just circling back to, to Trilogy quickly, um, you know, one of, the, one of the, the, the constraints in that part of the world is infrastructure. How do you see that playing out from, from, from here? Yeah, look, between now and when we have to make a decision in January next year, there's obviously a whole season of exploration work to be done, both on Arctic and Bornite, but at the same time, the federal government will be doing some of the work, if you like, on an all-weather road that would basically open up that part of the world, um, and they would aim to complete an EIS study probably around June this year. So that will be very informative to our decision as well. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Um, any more questions from the floor? Um, one of the things you've, you've uh, sort of talked about previously and uh, has been uh, Sarah Matoso, you know, is that still a, a kind of a somewhat um, non-core? And um, you've in the past also mentioned some copper exploration success there. Yeah, so I'd sort of take a step back and think when we started with the demerger from BHP, you know, we were gifted with a strong balance sheet. We were given a set of operations that we wanted to run in a different way, which we have done in the first couple of years in terms of lowering the cost base. Um, but we had no brownfield options and no greenfield options. So one of the things we've been working on over the last couple of years is to really develop those options to compete for capital, which we have with obviously the Eagle Downs acquisition and also the Arizona slash Hermosa acquisition. I guess now it's a combination of all the things we have in the portfolio and making sure they compete. So Cero, I think, is a, you know, it's an operation where the team's done a good job, but long term it's not necessarily a fit for South 32 as we think about how we move the quality of our portfolio upwards. You know, we have a very strong focus on making sure all our operations can generate a decent return on invested capital, and that is a bit more challenging for Cero. And, um, and, and the copper exploration there? Yep, copper exploration. Look, we've got a bit more work to be done in that space. We've only really begun over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, there's some good potential, but again, it's, it's early stage development. Um, and then a, just a final question on, uh, uh, on the flooding in Queensland. Are you seeing any disruption to your, to your uh, concentrate exports? Yes, yeah, so Queensland Rail came out today and made a statement that they thought the rail line would be up somewhere between mid-April to May. Right. Uh, they're still working on definitive dates. Look, from our perspective, the most important thing when the floods occurred was that we could actually get road transportation out to the mine, and that's important for us because we need the cement to actually put the fill back in the underground. The one thing Canton has is a fair bit of spare capacity, so the mill doesn't run at nameplate capacity, and if you think about shipments a year, we do about 16. So there's plenty of, if you like, flex in the capacity. Uh, what Rob and the team have done at Cannington, though, also, has built a couple of options that would allow us to basically truck out most of the concentrate with probably very little cost impact, so we see it as immaterial. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.